A spiritual teaching is a finger pointing toward reality, it is not reality itself. To be in a true and mature relationship with a spiritual teaching requires you to apply it, not simply believe in it. Belief leads to various forms of fundamentalism and shuts down the curiosity and inquiry that are essential to open the way for awakening and what lies beyond awakening. A good spiritual teaching is something that you work with and apply. In doing so, it works on you, often in a hidden way, and helps reveal to you the truth and falseness that lies within you. The primary task of any good spiritual teaching is not to answer your questions, but to question your answers. Power is a very dangerous aphrodisiac to the ego. Many people are deeply attracted to power. Even in our ordinary everyday world, issues of power arise. If you lead a company or you're a manager, you're exercising power over people's lives, they have to fit in with the structure and power dynamics that were put in place by the people above them. Power at any level, whether it's an intrinsic power or a relative power due to your position in the world, can really bring to light and activate desire, because power begets the desire for more power. In every esoteric spiritual tradition there are grave warnings about indulging in these kinds of powers and seeking out the psychic abilities that may come with awakening. The usual counsel is neither to push away or deny these powers, nor to grasp or desire or indulge in them. In Jesus' case, what we get through the story is a vital reflection of what it means to use power wisely. Jesus is a man of great authority, great inner power, and great charisma, and people are deeply attracted to him, whether for healing or spiritual transformation or simply to be in his presence. In example after example, he wields this power with wisdom and love. Throughout the Gospels we see how Jesus utilizes power, when he utilizes it and when he pulls back in. He leaves things as they are. He's a master of the wise use of power. In the original Greek, one of the meanings of sin, hamartia, is simply to miss the mark. When Legion says, for we are many, what are the many? Our modern interpretation would be that Legion has a completely fractured psyche. When the psyche fractures, it's like a pane of glass dropped on the ground, it shatters into many bits and pieces. Someone to whom this has happened is literally lost in the unconscious that becomes their reality. The waves of mind demand so much of silence. But she does not talk back, does not give answers nor arguments. She is the hidden author of every thought, every feeling, every moment. Silence. She speaks only one word. And that word is this very existence. No name you give her touches her, captures her. No understanding can embrace her. Mind throws itself at silence demanding to be let in. But no mind can enter into her radiant darkness, her pure and smiling nothingness. The mind hurls itself into sacred questions. But silence remains unmoved by the tantrums. She asks only for nothing. Nothing. But you won't give it to her because it is the last coin in your pocket. And you would rather give her your demands than your sacred and empty hands. Everything leaps out in celebration of mystery, but only nothing enters the sacred source, the silent substance. Only nothing gets touched and becomes sacred. Realizes its own divinity, realizes what it is without the aid of a single thought. Silence is my secret. Not hidden. Not hidden. Abiding means letting everything be as it already is, no matter what it is. If you're feeling good, let that be as it is. If you're feeling bad, let that be as it is. No matter what your emotional, physical, or mental state, let it be as it is and don't wish it to be otherwise. If you want it to be different from what it is, you're not abiding. You're picking and choosing and trying to control your experience. Again, the only way to know that we've seen into the true nature of something is that the story we're telling ourselves releases. Myth isn't about factual or historical truth, 
but about a deeper truth. In ancient times, people saw myth in a very different light as a vehicle that can transmit and carry a subtlety and richness of experience that simply cannot be conveyed by linear, conceptual forms of language. When these Velcro thoughts and emotions arise, the key is to face and investigate whatever belief structures underlie them. In that moment, inquiry is your spiritual practice. To avoid this practice is to avoid your own awakening. Anything you avoid in life will come back. Over and over again, until you're willing to face it, to look deeply into its true nature. The correct attitude is one where you have no more time to waste. This means that everything is oriented toward the now. The correct attitude is that there is no such thing as an awakening that happens tomorrow. Tomorrows never come. The time is now. You must be sincere. Sincerity and earnestness are the most beneficial attitudes to have. Have you ever noticed that you have never left here, except in your mind? When you remember the past, you are not actually in the past. Your remembering is happening here. When you think about the future, that future projection is completely here. And when you get to the future, it's here. It's no longer the future. Enlightenment is a destructive process. It has nothing to do with becoming better or being more or less happy. Enlightenment is the crumbling away of untruth. It's seeing through the facade of pretense. It's the complete eradication of everything we imagine to be true from ourselves to the world. Suffering occurs when you believe in a thought that is at odds with what is, what was, or what may be. Religion's primary function is to awaken within us the experience of the sublime and to connect us with the mystery of existence. Somewhere inside I always knew that everything was one, that I was eternal, unborn, undying, and uncreated. I understood that my essential nature was not limited by or confined to my personality structure or the body I seemed to be inhabiting. There had been a dissolving, in a somewhat radical way, of the world as I had known it and of the self I had known myself to be. Freedom is the realization that everything and everybody gets to be exactly as they are. Unless we've come to that point, unless we've seen that this is how reality sees things, then we're actually withholding freedom from the world. We're seeing it as a possession, and we're only concerned with ourselves. How good I can feel. How free I can feel. True freedom is a gift to everything and everybody. To you your dream is real because all of your thoughts confirm that it is real. But what is is more real than a thousand thoughts about how things should be? Life will conform neither to the story you tell yourself about it nor your interpretation of it. Believe a single thought that runs contrary to the way things are or have been and you suffer because of it. No exceptions. As long as you perceive that anyone is holding you back, you have not taken full responsibility for your own liberation. Liberation means that you stand free of making demands on others and on life to make you happy. When you discover yourself to be nothing but freedom, you stop setting up conditions and requirements that need to be satisfied in order for you to be happy. It is in the absolute surrender of all conditions and requirements that liberation is discovered to be who and what you are. Then the love and wisdom that flows out of you have a liberating effect on others. What is required after a glimpse of awakening is radical honesty, a willingness to look at how we unenlighten ourselves, how we bring ourselves back into the gravitational force of the dream state, how we allow ourselves to be divided. All of these are labels. All of them are fine. There is nothing wrong with any one of them until you actually believe they're true. As soon as you believe that a label you've put on yourself is true, you've limited something that is literally limitless, you've limited who you are into nothing more than a thought. True meditation has no direction or goal. It is pure wordless surrender, pure silent prayer. 
All methods aiming at achieving a certain state of mind are limited, impermanent, and conditioned. Fascination with states lead only to bondage and dependency. True meditation is abidance as primordial awareness. We've come to understand sin as a kind of moral failing, but that interpretation actually comes from the power structures of the church and religious authorities. If you can convince somebody that they are inherently impure and that there is a mistake at the center of their being, then sin becomes a wrongdoing that deserves blame. Often, if we are not careful, these ancient traditions and techniques, many of which I myself was taught, and which have great value, become an end instead of a means to an end. People end up with what is simply a discipline. They end up watching their breath for years and years and years, becoming perfect at watching their breath. But in the end spirituality is not about watching the breath. It's about waking up from the dream of separateness to the truth of unity. That's what it's about, and this can get forgotten if we adhere too closely to technique. There's no way to become happy. We simply need to stop doing the things that make us unhappy. True inquiry is experiential, you come into the natural state by letting go of control, by letting go of effort and resting in a state of vividness. It's very simple. It couldn't be simpler. Sit down, let everything be as it already is. That smallest point of light was a thought, just floating out there. And the thought was, I, and when I turned and looked at the thought, all I had to do was become interested in it, in any way interested, and this little point of light would move closer and closer and closer. It was like moving close to a knothole in a fence, when you get your eye right up to it, you don't see the fence anymore, you see what's on the other side. So as this little point of eye came closer, I started to perceive through this point called me. And I found that in that point called me was the whole world. The whole world was contained within that eye, within that little point called me. There wasn't really an eye. But an emptiness that could go into and out of that point, in and out of it, and it's like the whole world could flicker on and off, and on and off, and on and off. Don't know what it is. They'll forget that that thing flying through the sky is beyond all words, that it's an expression of the immensity of life. It's actually an extraordinary and wondrous thing that flies through the sky. But as soon as we name it, we think we know what it is. We see bird, and we almost discount it. Wake up or perish the world's problems are, by and large, human problems, the unavoidable consequence of egoic sleepwalking. If we care to look, all the signs are present to suggest that we are not only sleepwalking, but at times borderline insane as well. In a manner of speaking, we have lost, or at the very least forgotten, our souls, and we try very, very hard not to notice, because we don't want to see how asleep we are, how desolate our condition really is. So we blindly carry on, driven by forces we do not recognize or understand, or even acknowledge. We are no doubt at a very critical point in time. Our world hangs in the balance, and a precarious balance it is. Awakening to reality is no longer a possibility, it is an imperative. We have sailed the ship of delusion about as far as she can carry us. We have run her ashore and now find ourselves shipwrecked on an increasingly desolate land. Our options have imploded. Wake up or perish is the spiritual call of our times. Did we ever need more motivation than this? And yet all is eternally well, and more well than can be imagined, it's important that meditation is not seen as something that only happens when you are seated in a quiet place. Otherwise spirituality and our daily life become two separate things. That's the primary illusion that there is something called my spiritual life, and something called my daily life. When we wake up to reality, we find they are all one thing. It's all one seamless expression of spirit. The kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth, and men do not see it. Gospel of Thomas 1.13, in the Gospels, 
Jesus repeatedly challenges the religious authorities of the day, but ultimately what he's saying is relevant to all forms of religion. It wouldn't matter if he grew up a Jew, or a Christian, or a Buddhist, or a Hindu, because he's speaking about the structure of religion itself, its hierarchy, its tendency to become corrupted by human beings' desires for power, for influence, for money. Jesus, I think, had a profound understanding that the religion itself, instead of connecting us to the radiance of being, connecting us to that spiritual mystery, could easily become a barrier to divinity. As soon as we get too caught up with the rites and the rituals and the thou shalts and thou shalt nots of conventional religion, we begin to lose sight of the primary task of religion, which is to orient us toward the mystery of being and awaken us to what we really are. Of course, everyone around us sees themselves as essentially different from others and from life in general. So we move in a world where almost everyone we meet will be reflecting back to us this egoic sense of consciousness. To find liberation, we must wake up from this dream that our mind creates, that we're something separate than everything around us, that which comes and goes is not real, quit chasing it. It doesn't matter. What haven't you lost? That is what's important. What always is? What is there in bliss and in misery? Who you are is always present and is always the same. That which doesn't come and go is real. That is where freedom is found, nowhere else, meditation is like an oven that forces the truth out. All of a sudden there I was, standing there, holding my plate my of food at this wedding, and there was the realization that even though I don't see things the way most people around me see them. This is it. This is life, and it is absolutely wonderful, amazingly beautiful. The only thing left for me to do was to walk back into the world. What is required is the willingness to let life impact you, to let yourself see when life impacts you, to see if you go into any sort of separation about it, if you go into judgment, if you go into blame, if you go into should or shouldn't, if you start to point the finger somewhere other than at yourself. True realization, true enlightenment, comes through a complete relinquishing of personal will, a complete letting go. It's important to note, as well, that we do not become immune to misperception simply because we've had a glimpse of awakening. Certain fixations and conditionings will linger even after we perceive from the place of oneness. The path after awakening, then, is a path of dissolving our remaining fixations, our hang-ups, you might say. You don't die, the illusion of a separate self dies. Still, it may feel like you are going to die. Only when you are willing to die for the sake of truth can that grasping truly and authentically let go. Meditative self-inquiry is the art of asking a spiritually powerful question. And a question that is spiritually powerful always points us back to ourselves. Because the most important thing that leads to spiritual awakening is to discover who and what we are to wake up from this dream state, this trance state of identification with ego. And for this awakening to occur, there needs to be some transformative energy that can flash into consciousness. It needs to be an energy that is actually powerful enough to awaken consciousness out of its trance of separateness into the truth of our being. Inquiry is an active engagement with our own experience that can cultivate this flash of spiritual insight. When that little button gets pushed, something unconscious arises, and the invitation is to stay awake. That's it. Just stay awake, and then the alchemy happens. Just stay awake. Don't do the spiritual thing, like back up 50 steps and witness it from some infinite distance. That's somewhat better than being lost in it, but even that is a subtle form of unconsciousness because it's a subtle form of avoidance or withdrawing awakeness from what is. Awakeness is just here. You don't need to bring it backward or up or down or behind something to be essentially free of what's arising. It already is free. It doesn't need to back up. We have to realize that spirit is an infinite potential that includes everything. 
And all of our lives are proof that our spiritual nature contains everything at once that we can become clear or confused, that we can act loving or cruel. How we act and feel depends on how awake we are and how much we experience that silence, that peace, within. When we believe what we think, when we take our thinking to be reality, we will suffer. It's not obvious until you look at it, but when we believe our thoughts, in that instant, we begin to live in the world of dreams, where the mind conceptualizes an entire world that doesn't actually exist anywhere but in the mind itself. At that moment, we begin to experience a sense of isolation. Where we no longer feel connected to each other in a very rich and human way, but we find ourselves receding more and more into the world of our minds, into the world of our own creation, there are no enlightened individuals, there is only enlightenment. Enlightenment wakes up. Not you or I. You and I are rendered insignificant and non-existent. Enlightenment wakes up. That's why it is said that everybody is inherently enlightened. But that statement is misleading because it implies that everybody is a separate, special, unique little somebody who is inherently enlightened, and that misses the point. An illusion can't be enlightened. So it's not really true that everybody is enlightened. It's only true that enlightenment is enlightened. The freedom that's discovered isn't, I have attained enlightenment. The freedom is, my God, there is nobody here to be enlightened. Therefore, there is nobody there to be unenlightened. That's the light. Only the concept me thinks it needs enlightenment, freedom, liberation, and emancipation. It thinks it needs to find God or get a Ferrari, it's all the same thing when you get right down to it. As I watched and observed, day after day, week after week, month after month, even year after year, one day I had an epiphany, oh my gosh. Adults believe what they think. That's why they suffer. That's why they get into conflict. That's why they behave strangely, in ways that I don't understand, because they actually believe the thoughts in their head. What I realized was that adults spent a lot of time thinking, and more important than that and more odd, it seemed to me they actually believed what they were thinking. They believed the thoughts in their head, all of a sudden, I had an understanding of what was happening when adults communicated with one another, that what people were in fact communicating were their thoughts, and that each person believed that what they thought was actually true. This may happen on a big stage, but it may just mean being a benevolent grandmother or a mother or daughter or son or business owner. It doesn't have to look any particular way and in fact the resurrected state can actually look quite normal, and so I was sitting in the back of the church and watching people go through the communion. Reading the mystics who wrote so eloquently about their own profound experiences, I had felt a deep sense of connection, as if I'd reached back hundreds of years and connected with the living presence of another person. So I had an unconscious expectation that I was going to have the same feeling when I walked into this church and watched the Mass. But when the priest started to talk, it was extraordinarily disappointing. He talked about abortion, about how families should be, about intimate issues having to do with sexuality and how you should live your life, and as he talked, I felt that he had taken the presence created by this ritual of communion and thrown it on the floor and stepped on it. I had a sense that he had completely missed the Christian message. One's whole sense of passion and of drive belongs to the self to the ego, even when it's very positive or for the benefit of all beings. It's very hard to convey what moves you when all of that is gone. It comes from a place that is very, very simple. In the Zen tradition, they say, when you're hungry you eat, and when you're tired you sleep. That doesn't sound very exciting, but it's pointing to the simplicity of a life no longer driven by the inner forces of desire and aversion by wanting to accomplish, or to escape, or even to convey something. The human being is what links consciousness to its own infinite expressions in form. Through the form of an awake human being, consciousness becomes conscious of itself as both formlessness and as all forms. 
This is why, to the true sage, everything is divine, whole, and complete. Everything is God, the self. The problem was that all of the different adults had different ideas about what they thought the truth was, and so when they communicated there was this unspoken negotiation, this attempt to win each other over and to defend one's thinking and beliefs, everything depends upon your readiness and willingness to let go into the unknown and live from that mysterious and precious condition. The question is, are you ready to give up everything when God comes knocking at your door? This willingness to completely let go and surrender to the divine determines how free you will ultimately become. Whatever you hold back for yourself will become your prison. My advice is to give your whole heart, mind, body, and soul to grace when it comes. Ask yourself now, am I ready? Ultimate reality is not a certain state of consciousness, no matter how wonderful or blissful. Reality is the ground of all being, unborn and undying eternity. It is as present in one experience or state of consciousness as in any other. Reality, or truth, is that which is ultimately true in all states, at all times, in all locations. The word parable comes from a Greek word meaning comparison or analogy and is essentially a very brief story that conveys a spiritual truth. A parable is a bit like a riddle it has a meaning you can't completely understand with the logical, conditioned mind. A parable is meant to present your mind with something that pushes you to go beyond your current level of understanding in order to comprehend it. From that place, the only thing left to do is to be a benevolent presence in the world. I don't say this because one wants to do it or tries to do it. All attempts to be spiritual or pure or compassionate or loving, all of that striving is just what the ego or self tries to do or to be. But when all that falls away, there's literally nothing left to do, there's no life orientation that makes sense other than to be a selfless and benevolent presence. What we call ego is simply the mechanism our mind uses to resist life as it is. Aspiration is not so much a matter of the mind as of the heart, in that it is a reflection of what you cherish, love, and value most. You do not need to be reminded of what you truly love, only of what you do not love. And what you actually love is most truly reflected in your actions, not in what you feel, think, or say. The simplest thing one can say about the experiential knowledge of awakening is that it is a shift in one's perception. This is the heart of awakening. There is a shift in perception from seeing oneself as an isolated individual to seeing oneself, if we have a sense of self at all after this shift, as something much more universal everything and everyone and everywhere at the same time. Questioner, what's the best thing I can do for my awakening, Adyushanti, be with an enlightened teacher and listen.